If you listen to the news reports, it's hard to work out whether our economy is in a state of recovery or if things are actually looking still a little shaky. For just about every report you hear that things are starting to pick up, we hear another that indicates this could be an illusion. So where does the truth lie? Gerald Salente from the Trends Journal in America thinks that things are going to be very grim indeed, and I've invited him to explain why for us this morning. Mr Salente, you've made quite a dire prediction for the future. You say that by autumn 2012, we'll see the greatest depression hit the world that it's ever known. Why do you believe that that will happen? Well, actually, the markets had crashed in March of 2009. And what is only holding them up is the vast amounts, the tens of trillions of dollars that the central banks, including Australia's, have been pumping into the economic system to keep it afloat. And this is all false stimulus. You cannot print phantom money out of thin air backed by nothing and producing practically nothing without destroying the global economy. Let's look at gold prices. Now they're settling well over 1,100 US dollars. Take a look at the dollar. It's getting bashed against the major currencies worldwide. So the United States is the prime printer of this money and the other countries are just following suit. So as far as you're concerned, nothing has been done to fix the very reasons why we had the global financial crisis in the first place. Is that what you're saying? The only thing that's been done is they fattened up the fat banks already. They came out with this scheme called Too Big to Fail. This is the greatest bank robbery in, in world history. The only difference is the banks are doing the robbing. The names on Wall Street were named Salenti, Caruso, Mondavi, Puccini, Rossini, Bellini, Butoni. They call it the mafia. Wall Street's hijacked Washington and the central banks around the world. So they're just printing this money and they've banked the, the banks and, and financial institutions are borrowing at virtually no interest rate loans and reloaning it back to governments and businesses at higher interest rates. The only profiting is, that's going on out there are by the bank profiteers. Look at the unemployment rates here in the States. The effective unemployment rate when you put in people that are working part-time looking for full-time, the people that are no longer looking, the discouraged workers, we're looking at 17.5% unemployment. There's nothing that fiscal or monetary stimulus is going to do other than temporarily make it look like happy days are here again. You've said the markets started failing in March of this year, but if we're going to, uh, in fact, be heading towards this Great Depression that you're predicting by 2012 globally, then when are we going to start seeing things really fall apart? What are we looking for here? What we're looking for is a major currency crisis. Again, the, the things why no one can predict the future, we can see the trends. You never know when they're going to come up with, with schemes undreamed of. Who would have dreamed that America would have gone from the greatest entrepreneurial empire to a country now where only the too big to fails are being saved? And by the way, the merger of state and corporate powers, as we he have here in the U.S. with the ownership of General Motors, of AIG, of Citigroup, of, of Fannie F and May and Freddie Mac, what Mussolini called the merger of state and corporate powers fascism. So you can't tell what they're going to do next. If it becomes to a point, and we're starting to see it now, when we see countries like India buying up 200 tons of gold, what we're looking for is a financial currency crisis. When will that happen? If it doesn't happen before the end of 2009, we're estimating that it will happen by the first quarter of 2010. Now, you've said that Canada, Australia and New Zealand will not be in great shape either in the future, but compared to most other nations, they seem like paradise. We're being constantly told in Australia that we've been relatively insulated from the global financial crisis. What is your take on how insulated we are here in Australia? Your interest rates are still relatively low. And, and Australia is more insulated because you don't have the debt problems that the, they have here in the U.S. The American consumer is $14 trillion in debt. The government is running $1.5 trillion yearly deficits. The total debt is uh, $11.5 trillion. 
and you're not fighting major wars as we're draining trillions of dollars from our treasury. I mean, there, there is an Australian presence in the wars, but nothing compared to what the U.S. is squandering. So you're not going to be hit as bad, and, and you will also have a, a better opportunity not to depend on so much from foreign imports to develop your country. So the smaller, more manageable countries will, will fare much better than those such as the U.S., where we've exported our productive capacity overseas and have become essentially a country where 72 percent of our GDP is consumer-based. You also have a great natural resource reservoir that's proving to be very beneficial. As long, uh, as well rather as uh, this Great Depression that you're predicting and, and the picture that you paint is very bleak Mr Salente. Billions are unemployed, homeless and desperate, countries bankrupt, trade packs broken, tariffs rise, borders closed, protectionist national and anti-globalisation movements are moved out of the margins and into the mainstream. Immigrants brought in during boom times blamed for bringing down wages, stealing jobs and rising crime are being rounded up and deported. Do you see this as some kind of opportunity for us now to start getting ourselves into some kind of good shape or some sort of realistic fiscal shape? The countries that put their countries first and the, and the citizens above political power and, and political needs will respond in, in positive ways. Those that just use this to further their political agendas, and I'm a political atheist, they'll bring the countries down with them. But you're already starting to see it. There are uprisings around the country. Again, one of our top trends for 2010 is going to be anti-immigration. It's going to be a huge issue. Immigration here is, is something that we're talking about as well, just in terms of uh, asylum seekers wanting to come to our country. And there is some kind of a discussion around that, that we should perhaps be lowering the number of immigrants that we bring in so that we can better accommodate refugees. Well, again, there's too much productive capacity worldwide and too many products on the marketplace and not enough <laughs> other productive elements to take up the huge labor force. Just think of the numbers. Go back 100,000 years ago to 1900 to put 1.5 billion people on the planet. From 1900 to now, we've added over 5 billion people. So when people call themselves a population expert, who are they kidding? Nobody's ever seen this kind of population growth before. So it's really a very difficult situation to deal with, and there's no easy answers to it. However, what we can say is that most countries don't need more people. They need to develop in a way that's going to educate the existing populations to higher levels and bring rise the tide of what's already there rather than bringing in cheap labor to undercut the marketplaces. Who do you see as the winners in this changing scenario? Self-sustaining is the word. Countries that could trade within their own borders, build their own local economies and uh, import as little as they can will be the ones that are on the forefront. Also the countries that use technology to advance the society. For example, uh, what's going on in India is very interesting. They're, they're using high technology to produce products and services that appeal mostly to the poorer Indian class, and it's a huge one. So they'll have refrigerators, for example, that sell for $70 U.S., stoves that sell for $43, cell phones that two cents a minute, $20 a cell phone. Also, that in times of desperation, necessity becomes the mother of invention. Economies and governments that put their money into developing innovation and self-sustaining will be the ones that will be the biggest winners. Those that continue their imperial overreach, such as the UK and the US, they'll fall into the hardest of times. So it's almost that uh, you're predicting we'll see uh, some kind of anti-globalization happen. It's already happening. It's just not being pushed forward on the major media. One of the things that people need to understand, and we use the model that was the most effective and most productive, if you went back to the States when America was the world power, the model was all about what was going on in Main Street, USA, not Wall Street. When we look toward mom and pop businesses and people supporting the communities and the neighborhoods and the localities, not about Walmarts or chain stores. When we had the model of more 
family farms, not this low-grade factory farm. This isn't rhetoric. We were the most egalitarian nation on earth when that was the model. So for a country like Australia, as large as it is, with so many natural resources that you have, if the countries go more toward innovation and self-sustaining, the myth of a, we need a global economy is just that. Well, it's a very interesting question, and we're going to see the answer to that one very soon. But, Gerald Salenti, it's been fascinating speaking with you this morning. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, thank you for having me.